P-T-A-L. And boards is saying, or the, the website that I went to is saying that if a baby is born after 20 weeks, it is going to be preterm. And let's say it's a demise, then it will be preterm and abortion or miscarriage. Okay. So I did want to clarify that to make sure that we were all on the same page with that. Can you Everybody say that again? Got it? Huh? Can you say it again? Preterm born after 20 weeks. Let's say you've got a fetal demise born at 29 weeks. Mm -hmm. It is going to be an abortion or miscarriage and a preterm after 20 weeks. Before 37. That's right. 20 to 37. Right. But yes, to 37 because anything 37 and after is considered term. So if you had a fetal demise at 39 weeks, then that would be term, term not preterm. But it would still be It's still going to be a miscarriage. If, a, if it's a fetal demise, if the baby's dead. Okay, so it's still going to be a term and miscarriage as opposed to preterm between 20 and 37 weeks is preterm. 37 weeks and above is term. Before the 20 weeks, it's just a miscarriage or abortion. But if you wouldn't doing, put it under the preterm, you would not if it's greater than 20 weeks. Because it's just, it's not, it's not viable at 20 weeks, even if it was living. So if it were just GMP system, because it's past 20 weeks, it was a vi it's considered a viable pregnancy. Right, so but it's it was, demise, so it's not going to count as an actual baby baby, a delivery for parents. The parents, pregnancy. The parents. no, it's not going to. So like if it was a first pregnancy, it would be G1PO. Right, and then you hit a demise between that preterm. <laughs> if the preterm is 20 to 37 weeks, yes, it would be a para. You would be para one, but it's not live. Okay, that's what I had read. So, yeah. and that was one of the questions I thought I might have to email you about, just because yeah. I read and read and read. But I'm not going. And boards is probably not going to test you on GP. Okay, it's gonna be hey, they're not going to do. Guys, are you are you listening? Or are you just talking? I'm trying. Um, boards is probably not. Our, I'm 99 sure boards is not going to test you on G and P. Just gravita and para. They're going to test you on the GPTAL. Yeah. Okay, they're not going to, because that is, in labor delivery, they just do G and P, and they don't go into all that. So the board is going to test you on the. But it talked a little bit about it in the book. Yeah, it did talk a little bit about it, but you just don't, I didn't see anything that was referenced on boards on the site that I go on about G and P. Okay. <coughs> So I'd rather you understand the long one <coughs> as opposed to the GMP and not get confused on that. Okay. I really do a lot of research in what boards wants you to know and that kind of stuff because this is a specialty area. It's a specialty area. Boards is not testing you on the specialty areas. They're testing you on the very minimal information on the specialty area. All right, so what we went over yesterday Cardiac problems, and Dane, I really like that um, video that you posted. I looked at it last night. I was all by myself, and I'd already cooked supper, and she thought, what am I going to do? All my laundry's done. The bathrooms really need to be cleaned, but <laughs> Mama will be here on Friday, so she can clean them. <laughs> so I looked at it. It was really, really good. I thought, if you, if you guys get an opportunity to watch that video, it is really good. So when we talk about rheumatic fever um, and any cardiac issues, what is gonna be one of the first things that you're gonna notice on that mom? Irregular heart rate. Irregular heart rates and murmurs. murmurs. Absolutely. Aren't we gonna ask them if they've ever had strep? Mm -hmm. right. And did you take all your medications for the strep? You'd be surprised how many people <coughs> don't take their medication. Yeah. 
No, I will not be. I, I am going to talk to you about, I mean, you're going to have to know about the twins and that kind of because the other one was just multiple. And basically, everything that's in the PowerPoint as far as the twins and stuff, that's not the video. No. I'm going to have to turn this down because I'm having a major. <coughs> You know, it ain't all about y'all right now, it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so lots of people are not going to be able to take, or not going to take their antibiotics like they should. So I always ask that question, too, when I'm asking them about, did you have strep? Were you treated? Did you take all of your antibiotics? That's more, because that, that, that's going to give me an idea that there may be, that may be the cause. Of what's happening. You had strep when you were a little kid. You didn't take it all. Did it come back? Absolutely. Because what happens is that strep lays dormant in the heart muscles. And it lays hard. And that's where a lot, that's why we're <coughs> seeing that. Because we don't. And a lot of it is not education. Educating our patient on how important it is. Because I know when I was growing up, my mom was, you know, couldn't give me my antibiotic, and if I felt better after a couple days, then I didn't take it anymore. And that is lack of education. So that's why we as nurses, we have got to educate our patients to let them know you've got to take every, every day this is, is ordered for you. You have to take it. Because there are consequences that can happen a long time down the road. Okay, so it's very, education is major, major um, all right, let's look at bleeding disorders. <clears throat> threatened abortion, threatened miscarriage. What happens with that? Bleeding. You're going to have some bleeding, but what's the main thing? The it's cervical ossus is closed. The cervical os is going to stay closed. <coughs> so an intimate, <laughs> imminent, why can I say that? And the cervix is going to be open. Is there anything we can do about that? No. no. Just watch my mom for shock because of the bleeding. Make sure that, I mean, we've got to do some um, psych, good communication skills um, as mom's going through this situation that's getting ready to happen. What about an ectopic pregnancy? How am I going to know that this patient's coming in and she may possibly have an ectopic? Pain. Right there where the sharp. Lots of pain. What kind of bleeding is she going to have? Purple. It's going to be a purplish color. And then remember the grapes? The grape purple grapes? I thought, that was, I thought that was the mold. Yeah. Sorry. There's no bleeding when she thinks you're pregnant. Yes, I got ahead of myself. Okay. My, brain, my brain is going like, okay, what do I need to cover? What do I need to cover? What do I need to cover? Back up. Get in reverse. All right. So with my ectopic pregnancy, I'm going to have lots of sharp pain. Um, may not be a lot of bleeding at that point. How am I going to know that that's an ectopic pregnancy? Transvaginal ultrasound will be able to tell us better. Okay? And we're going to have to go in and do surgery. Can we save the tube? No. Probably not, depending on how large it is, how many weeks gestation she is, because it may grow and rupture. And then if it ruptures, we've got a chance of doing. What's going to happen if that ruptures inside the abdominal cavity? Infection. 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 <laughs> yes, my mom could bleed to death. Yeah, she dies. Barb is always and then she does. <laughs> She's dying. Okay. So um, with the ectopic, it is a little bit harder to diagnose because a lot of times people think, oh, they're having appendicitis. Okay. But then when we take them inside, 
Uh, well, before we take them in the OR, we're going to do that pregnancy test. When y'all were in the OR, did y'all see how many times they asked about pregnancy test? Did you see it? How, I mean, they were. <coughs> and I'll tell you a sad story. After I checked it out. Um, several years ago at Northeast, um, they didn't ask about the pregnancy test. Um, and when they got the patient in, the patient was pregnant. It ended up losing the baby due to that one in anesthesia. So pregnancy test is very important when we take them to surgery. Now, obviously with the ectopic pregnancy, it's gonna show that they're pregnant and that's the reason I'm going in. But patients that are coming in and they're not, I don't care if you come in and say, I promise I haven't have, had sex in six months. I don't care. I don't trust you. Yeah, I'm being nice. I mean, I'm being ugly. Um, but I'm really being ugly. Because I, I know, I remember how many people, no, I hadn't had sex. You know, when I was talking to my daughter, no, mom, I promise I hadn't had sex. I'm like, right. <laughs> But anyway, um, you're going on the pill anyway. <laughs> Whether you say you had that or not, you're going to college, you're going on the pill. Um, but anyway, pregnancy has got, we, that's the reason why we're going in there. Ectopic pregnancy, I would love to be able to say that to you. But depending on the week's gestation is and how big the embryo is, depends on if I can save it or not. Okay? Um, all right, what is that colon sign? Glutus around the belly button. What's that telling me? There's bleeding in the abdominal cavity. Absolutely. All right, um, now let's go to the mole. Purple bleeding. Absolutely. Is there anything of a fetal material, anything in the mole? It's just a bunch of tissue, a bunch of cells, fluid filled cells, all clumped together. So it's really not losing a baby. I thought you said if it's a partial mole, it can have a partial mole has some. Okay. But my big mole, the whole mole, no, nothing. Nothing. Absolutely. Benign tumor. <coughs> never that mole can never develop it anything. Yes, it can. Adenocarcinoma can. Not that tumor. The mama. Yes. Okay. Did you hear what she said? No. no. After moms have a mole. Not with this mold that they're in. We get rid of it. Um, later on, they are increased risk for adenocarcinoma. Is that both types of molds? Hmm? Is that both types of molds? Both types of molds. Yes, they're in. Obviously, the whole mold, not the partial, is going to put her more at risk. Okay? So it is very important when I talk to the moms about their pregnancy. That they, I don't ever ask them, did you have a mole pregnancy? Because they don't know what that is unless they've had it. And I'll say, did you have any type of pregnancy that was not viable? Meaning, was there anything <coughs> abnormal about it? So I can't go to them and say, what's well, nobody knows what a mole is. Okay, so you've got to be really careful about how you ask because I want to know if I need to keep that on their chart to watch them as they get older. Okay, to watch them that they may develop carcinoma. All right, then we're going to have a lot of that prune juice looking go. And remember with the mole, the uterus gets very, very large, i.e. if we thought she was six months, she might be measuring 12, I mean, six weeks, she might be measuring 12 weeks. Okay, it gets very, very, you know, bundle height is really, really important, and it's something that's watched throughout the pregnancy because it, that's going to be a good indication of what could be going on, i.e., what? Too much, Too much fluid, which is called polyhydramnios or oliguria or olihydramnios means too little, not less than three. Right. All right. 
Incompetent cervix. What's the bad thing about that? <laughs> it won't stay close. <laughs> sorry cervix, right? Just a sorry cervix that can't maintain the pregnancy. What would be the first treatment of that? Put them to bed. Absolutely. Put them to bed. Then what could we do? Cerclage. But we got to have something to tie, don't we? Yeah. And that means that they're down for the rest of the pregnancy. Okay. Um, I remember right after I had Dylan, um, I never had my period, never had my period, never had my period. So then, I mean, of course, I was nursing, so I didn't expect it. Well, then I stopped nursing him, and then I never got my period, and I never got hurt my period, and I was like, oh, dear Jesus, please, please, God, don't let me be pregnant. Yeah, and I was like, I cannot handle another Dylan, please. So I went to the doctor, and he was like, oh, my goodness, you've retained a little bit of the placenta. So I had an infection growing, so I had to go in and get all that out. Um, but I said to him while we were talking, while we were waiting on my pregnancy test, <coughs> if I am pregnant, I, I'll just have to deal with it. What is my chances of having a normal pregnancy? Zero percent. And I said, okay, so what is your plan for me? If I'm pregnant, what, what's going to happen? I was going to have a cerclage at eight weeks, and I would have been down the whole time. Oh. So, thank you, Jesus. I was pregnant. I just retained just a tiny bit of my placenta, and it wasn't letting me. So, I said, what are we going to do? He said, well, we're going to have to go in and do an DNC. So, we did a DNC, and I said, while you're there, just tie those tubes. <laughs> just in case. And when you tie them... Throw them on the floor and stomp on them. I never <laughs> want another baby. It was not, I always wanted four children, but that wasn't happening. But anyway, so that incompetent cervix is going to affect you. The problem is we don't know until it happens. And then sometimes that fetus may not be viable and we may lose that baby. Um, but the good thing is, and I try to look at a positive thing out of everything else is if my mom loses that baby there, at least the next time she gets pregnant, we're gonna be on her like flies on poo poo, okay? We're gonna get her the first sign of her doing anything and she may automatically get a cerclage at eight weeks. She may automatically be down. But if we can get a viable fetus out of that, that's what we want. So that's the bad thing about it and then the good thing. All right, preeclampsia, what's that? High blood, High blood pressure during pregnancy. What would be my? What would be considered the blood pressure of mild preeclampsia? 140 over 90. 140 over 90 or a little higher. What other kinds of things happen with mild? Headache, visual changes. Protein in the urine. Protein urea, and it, it may just be like one plus, but it's there. And our enzymes are going to be elevated. Our liver enzymes are going to be elevated as well when it comes to mild eclampsia, preeclampsia. What about severe? What's my blood pressure doing there? 160 over 100 or higher, really, really high. What are you going to see with that protein urea? Urea. Three plus. What about? Visual disturbance with that. Edema. Edema. And the edema is going to be sudden. sudden. Like Kristen with her 20 pounds in how many days? Two days, 20 pounds. Big edema. Four plus kidding edema. Absolutely. All right. Um, one of the biggest things that we want to make sure is mama doesn't have cerebral hemorrhages and she doesn't have seizures. Bed rest, all that good stuff. All right, so we talked about MAG a little bit yesterday, because that is technically an anticonvulsant medication, if you look at the classification of it. But it's also a smooth muscle relaxant. 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 Okay, so it, it, it relaxes those. So if you've got a mama that's in preeclampsia, there 
is a possibility that she could then go into eclampsia. And what makes that transition and what makes the diagnosis seizure change act, seizure activity. is seizure activity. So she may be preeclamptic, but as soon as she has that first seizure, she is now eclamptic. Okay? So our goal in preeclampsia is to make sure that she doesn't have a seizure. That's another reason why. That is another reason why we, at this point, we don't want her to be active. Okay, so that's one reason why we're giving her the mag. The other reason is to help bring that blood pressure down because it's our heart is a smooth muscle and the other action of this medication is to keep her from having a seizure so it's an anticonvulsive as well so that is our goal of treatment when i have a patient who is preeclampsia i don't want her to have a seizure i've got I'm, i mean i'm anticipating it i've got everything readily available for that, I've got to make sure that she doesn't. I've got to be on her. We talk a lot about MAG, um, but I did not talk to you about the antidote for MAG yesterday. Calcium gluconate? It's calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate. So that is when any mama is on, or any patient's on magnesium, you need to have calcium gluconate right there readily available. <coughs> um, so make sure you've got that and you'll know your dosages for that mom if that's the situation. The other thing that I didn't talk about yesterday, and I haven't talked about the health syndrome yet, but I'm going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes. But one of the things that our goal is, if we know that mama is preeclamptic, I want to get her as many days close to her due date as I can. So it's one day at a time, one minute at a time when I'm here to help her not have that seizure and get that baby to a viable state. But what happens if I know that this is going to happen, she's going to deliver. I really worry about the maturity of my baby's lungs or my mama's baby's lungs. So what we can do is we can give them phenomethasone, which is a steroid. And we like to see that that is in within 24 hours. So, you know, remember we talked about antibiotics with pre, then we talk about when our membranes are ruptured. I mean, when mama's got group B, B beta strep that we would like to see an antibiotic last for four hours four hours before we deliver. The same thing with this. I want, I want 24 hours of when I give that injection until she delivers, okay? We can also do an amniocentesis at the, if mom's not contracting, if mom is still at a stable point I can, we can do an amniocentesis after that 24 hours to see if those lungs are mature. And what we're wanting to hear from that amnio is that they are mature, that the baby is going to be able to be okay breathing wise when we deliver. So then, not that means that we're gonna do an immediate C-section or we're gonna get this or induce this lady but what it's telling me that if she does present signs and symptoms of an uncontrollable blood pressure, a weight gain of 20 pounds, you know, the protein is spilling. The more she's going through these situations and the more signs and symptoms, the more evidence that's saying get that baby out. Because not only is my baby suffering, my mom's suffering as well. So we, the physicians have to make a decision on 
yes, I want those babies' lungs to be mature, but if my mom is showing me all these signs and symptoms, then that baby's suffering. What I need to get that baby out. <laughs> Kristen, how many weeks were you? I was thir I was thirty nine weeks. It was oh, it was a hot freaking mess. Went in that day, like my my ankles were like this big. It was nuts. Um, they did an all uh, trans abdominal ultrasound uh -huh. so that there was no amniotic fluid. They told me that my son's head was measuring forty two weeks and that his body was measuring thirty eight and that he might have Down syndrome. And like all this stuff, and as soon as they got him out, all the fluid went. He was fine. Like. So the fluid might have been backed up behind him. Was he large? No. It was just it was just a big hot mess. <laughs> hot mess. But is he healthy? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because it could have been a worse situation. Thirty nine weeks, that's great. I'm glad that they got you in here and didn't mess around. Thirty nine weeks, the baby's lungs are mature. Yeah, he's fine. Yeah. So I'm you know, I'm worried. But the ones I really worry about is the earlier. The ones that are, you know, 27, 28, 29, 30. Um, and the rule of thumb is if we can get, you know, we usually just say if we can get them to 32 weeks, that's good. 34 is amazing. That's what we do with my sister. Yeah. She was having, she was in and out twice at like 28 weeks and 30 weeks. She would stay like an overnight. They would give her like the mag sulfate and they went ahead and gave her the prednisone to in right. case she delivered because they said we might could put you off for like seven days so right. she got that seven days and then it happened again well they administered the mag sulfate and she got like another seven days so she was like at 36 weeks but they were very pleased wonderful wonderful and you know what that goes to excellent nursing care and mama listening to what's happening with her body mm -hmm. And going and saying, I don't feel right. I know something's wrong. Somebody, and I, I love it when mamas call me and say, I just don't feel right. Da, 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 da. And then they come up with my unit and I check them all out and everything is wonderful. Just to see the relief on their face. Just to say, you know what? Everything is okay. And I don't care. And I tell them, because I talk to moms for a long time. I tell them. You come in every day if you want to. I don't care. I want you as a mama that's pregnant with this baby to be reassured because it's stressful to be pregnant. It's very stressful. And then if you got added worries, you know, oh my gosh, is my baby not moving? Oh my gosh, am I, am I really swelling? Oh my gosh, am I spilling protein? Just bring them in and let's reassure them that this is okay. So... The beta-methazole is one that um, we can give and it will help. There again, we've got to look and see how is baby tolerating this. <clears throat> I'm not going into, I mean, I played the other day with um, a little bit of fetal monitoring with y'all. But we, yes, we look at mom and the spilling of the protein and the edema and the blood pressure and all that kind of stuff, but i got to look and see how baby's tolerating it. So there's lots of things that is going to tell me I don't like my environment in here. I'm ready to go. So we're looking at two patients that we've got to. And any time that baby starts showing signs of fetal distress, they're going to pop you right in with a C-section. <clears throat> and you know what? Healthy baby. Healthy mama. Ever how we got to get it? We, if we've got to be a C-section, we're going to do a C-section. But I don't want to jeopardize the safety of my mama and my baby. Yes, betamethasone will help. That is, if we can get it in and it stay 24 hours before the baby's born. That is my goal. I, I want, and sometimes I, it doesn't happen. But I, if I know that I can get 24 hours in your baby's house, were you able to wait a Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So how many weeks did they give you the, before you had them? Well, I was admitted. Because like I said, I had all the surgery. Right. And then I was admitted and had the train the blood transfusion uh -huh. and I made it a week. And then they got tangled and they got right. someone else. Right. And then that's why I was in there. 
And they, I mean, it was either that or they say people are going to die. Yeah. But then they didn't know that that was the disease that reversed. So it was actually more of a blessing because they made people like you. Because that's what the blood transfusion was for. Right. None of it wasn't sent at all. Oh, my God. Well, I know. Well, see, Michael originally had the blood transfusion. They did the first my first open mm-hmm. Like Nathan was the recipient the musical yeah. bubble was huge. Yeah. He was getting double blood flow. Right. So he would be making a lot of pee. His bubble was huge and then Michael was like smashed and he was getting bubble because he didn't have no urine. And Nathan was a heart better. Yeah. So he was getting all the white. Yeah. And then it was <laughs> I mean, I don't know anything else to say, but they are here. It's the same thing. Toxemia is a term that we used to use a long time ago. Yeah, I just mean it like used interchangeably. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing. Can they do blood transfusion baby in utero? That's what her baby's having. Yeah. They inject it into the middle of the board. Yeah. I mean, if anything is um, happened to the these babies, or, I mean, anything like different, those babies have them. That's okay. why they're such a mirror. Yeah. Like I said, they did the experimental kind of surgery where they touched the placenta in half with the laser, but then they couldn't get to the vessels that were in the placenta, and that's where the reverse Because they, like, disconnected all the top. Mm-hmm. That's all the placenta, so they can never get to it. But so there was a chance that they were right. But it was like 3% chance. <laughs> and the twin, the twin is rare anyway. It's very, very rare. Yeah. So, of course, that happens. Yeah, that's what the, <laughs> that was the beginning of it, was the twin, and then it reversed. And then all the other issues that you have, like bleeding in the brain, oxygen is really bad for the guys. If you didn't know, it's very dangerous. Oh, yeah. And y'all will learn more about that after um, with Miss Moore. Okay. About the O2 for the newborns and yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Does he have any visual problems? No. They told me they were going to have to have glasses, the dome. So we had to go to the, uh, uh, to the doctor all, every week. Uh, all, not they, they, are, they were about to do the surgery to correct it because like, the retina was falling. Uh, it wasn't going to go back. And then the day before the surgery, they changed the entire thing on that. That was the longest case of ROP that I've heard ever seen. That's the only part they were going to miss with the surgery. Because they were not doing it all the time. No, no, the day before it did it on the screen. And then they were filming next Michael would have that. Four tour. So there's one kindergarten. And he was playing baseball. He wanted to There's nothing wrong with that. This is amazing. Yeah, a lot of times, but you've got to remember that they are telling you so you want. This could happen. Yeah. Sometimes it gets where, oh my gosh. You know, don't tell me anything. I know. <laughs> just don't tell me if it's a chance. Just don't tell me. Yeah. All right. Okay. So now let's. Um, we talked about we were in preeclampsia. Now we know the difference in eclampsia. Now the moms, once they have that seizure, they're going to stay on the mags. Okay. Stay on the mags. Um, even after postoperatively, I mean postpartum. They will be on the mag. Mag is not a medication, and I think I've said this before, that you can't just stop. It has to be weaned off slowly. You cannot just stop. So if mom was on mag prior to delivery, she's delivered, she's going to be on mag after. So that means I still got to watch the same things that I watched while she was on um mag and the signs and symptoms of that. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And we talked about, I think I talked about yesterday, one of the um, impending signs that a seizure is going to happen is the epigastric pain. And I don't know, I cannot tell you what relation, why that happens. I wish I could. If somebody knows, y'all can tell me. I don't know. A clenchia. So eclampsia or preeclampsia, and then when that mom starts having some epigastric pain, then you can better watch that a seizure is getting ready to happen. And you better do all the precautions that you can um, 
to prevent that. With moms that are preeclamptic, that means that they haven't had a seizure or anything, don't think that as soon as they deliver that they're home free. Okay? They're not. Because they still can have a seizure up to 48 hours after delivery. Okay, 48 hours after delivery, they still can have that seizure. So you, they still going to be on mag, and you're still going to look for seizure precautions. Immediately after I was born, my mom had a mild seizure. I had Yeah, and so that's why you don't just think getting the baby out is going to, yes, it's going to help some of the situation, but it doesn't mean she's clear a good 48 hours. We've got to watch her after that. All right, so we, the, when we're in the hospital, these are the kinds of things that we need to do. Um, of course, immediately do MAG. And let me tell you about MAG and how it's delivered. Um, one of the things that they do, have you ever heard of a loading dose? Okay, a loading dose is basically like a bolus. Okay, it's like a bolus. So they will actually have it pre, or we'll mix it up either four or six grams in a bag of fluid okay so it, it's like a piggy bag and you're gonna have to if whether it's a hundred or and i think it is a hundred cc's tell me the doctor's going to decide on the severity of the blood pressure he will decide is it four grams or is it six grams i don't usually see five grams it's either four or six so the, the severity of the blood pressure and what's going on with the mom, how much protein she's got in the urine, how much edema she's got, they'll decide to give a loading dose. And that loading dose needs to be done in 20 minutes. So that means I got to get that in there quick. And then after the mom gets the loading dose, the physician will then decide how many grams do they want an hour. So they're going to give a loading dose from four to six grams, and then they will put Generally, they start at three to two to three grams per hour. And of course, you're gonna to have to do some calculations with that, okay? Depending on how much fluid it is. The other thing that I didn't talk uh, y'all about is we've gotta watch that mag level, right? Because I'm giving them lots of magnesium via that bolus and via that gram. I mean, two grams is a lot. You know, put them six grams, in there, that's a lot. That mag level is going up. The mag level is usually 1.3 to 2.5. I've got to watch that because my mom could get toxic from that. When you see the lab values, and you will, as they are, your parents, they're going to be taking those magnesium levels very frequently. Sometimes it's as common as every four to six hours. Especially if I bolus them with six grams of mag and then I put them on two grams, then I can say within four hours, four to six hours, they're going to do a mag level. The thing that you got to watch is as it, as it goes up and up and up, there are certain things that happen with the mama when, or you can see when the levels get at certain amounts. Okay? So it's 1.3 to 2.1 is what you're going to see. But when you get around 3.5 to 5, if that mom's mag level is 3.5 to 5, one of the first things you're going to see is that patella reflex is going to be gone. So 3.5 to 5, one of the first things we're going to see is that patella reflex gone. When they get from like five to 6.5, respiratory paralysis can happen. Paralysis can happen. So that mom can be paralyzed in her respiratory tract and stop breathing. How about a picture? Oh, I hope that I give the calcium gluconate when that patella reflex is gone, then I want to give it. I don't want to give to where she's not breathing. And then if it gets higher than seven, she's going to arrest. Or there's a possibility that she's going to have cardiac arrest. 
So you can see why that calcium gluconate is very important to have right there with you. And you can see how important it is to make sure that you've got those lab values of that mag level. Any mama that's on that, you better make sure that we're watching that mag level. I've got to know, mom, and, and I don't want to wait until she doesn't have any reflexes before I start doing something. I want to keep up with it. Um, she's going to be on antihypertensive medications. Sometimes we get on sedatives if they, um, if seizure activity, if we can't get it controlled. We're going to watch for pulmonary edema, circulatory, and renal things. I need a catheter in that mama. I don't need her to get up. And I need to make sure that she's putting out at least 30 cc's an hour. I would hope more, especially if she's um, on a diuretic. And sometimes they will order Lasix to help pull some of that fluid, especially if they've got pitting in there. Um, I'm always looking to see if she's having any signs of labor. And I'm not going to go into the signs of labor for you. And there may be um, a chance that I may need to go ahead and do a C-section. So as you have patients who are pre-eclampsic and, and, and even go into eclampsia, you are always preparing for the worst situation. You are always having that C-section in the back of your mind to get ready and go. Okay, because these, it is within minutes sometimes that these babies have got to be born. And if they're gonna be, how many minutes do they take you? For 10 minutes? Yeah. By the time we found out by my grandma, because I called my grandma because I didn't know. I was up there by myself. They ripped the phone out of my hand, ran me down the hallway. By the time my mom, my grandma called my mom, they were already in the house, like 10 minutes. So when I say go, I mean go. Yeah. Kristen, how, I mean, you were yeah. there. Um, they, I still push mine out, though. Um, so you delivered vaginal? Yeah. I did, even though the doctor kept saying it. The doctors and the nurses were arguing. The nurses wanted to take me back to their C-section. The doctor said I could do it. My blood pressure was like 200 over 110 while I was pushing. And the nurses were like, she needs to go for a C-section. And the doctor was like, she can do this. She's young. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think was right in that situation? The nurses. The nurses. Who is always right? The nurses. The nurses. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hate that, at least that he was born quickly. He was. And, you know, but I would, I probably would have been that nurse saying, we're not a C-section. <laughs> you know, stand up, but, you know, sometimes they ain't got no sense. They just need us to tell them which way which direction to go. So your blood pressure dropped dramatically right after the baby was right born? Right after. Like, it was, was ridiculous. And like, you know, whenever I went back home, because I had gained 65 pounds during that pregnancy, and by the time I left the hospital with diuretic medicine, I left in my pre-pregnancy. That's talking about a major, major fluid shift, right? Well, I had been telling them, like you said, I said, I don't feel good, I don't feel good, I don't feel good, I don't feel good. And they're like, oh, it's just because your blood pressure is high. Like, they sent me home with one of those 24 hour proteins. Mm -hmm. They came back and, like, oh, your protein's a little elevated. And, like, all this stuff. I kept telling them, like, every single day I was going to about, I don't feel good. And they're like, you're fine. <laughs> and then, like, the, that one day, like, I woke up and I was like, I'm not fine. Right. And there it goes back to the whole situation is you're not listening to your patient. Those nurses, and, and I don't want to be ugly here, but sometimes in doctor's offices, they don't have nurses. They have medical office assistants. Do they have the ability to assess? Do they have the ability to critically think and figure out what's going on? And that drives me crazy. So when I usually call, when I would call when I was pregnant or whatever, or what's going on, when my kids were sick, I didn't even talk to them. And if somebody would get on and I would say, what's your status? <laughs> what's your status? What, what are you? Are you a secretary? Are you, uh, I need to speak to a nurse. RN, LPN, I don't care. Give me a nurse. But you're a nurse. You should know. Mm -mm. I ain't a nurse right now. I'm a patient. I had a nurse practitioner who was in school today. 
I told her on Friday that something was wrong when I was pregnant with my daughter. I was like, I feel like I'm going into labor. She's like, you should take it on you know, stress test and put me on a monitor and they're like, no, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. I was like, I'm telling you, I'm this not right. baby is coming. She was born today. Nobody listens to mom. Nobody listens. Why don't we listen to people? Just don't understand. Don't understand. All right, so that's our hospital care. Um, and now, this is another thing that can happen when my patients are preeclampsic and eclampsic. They can go into um, what they call the HELP syndrome. And so not only am I watching that bag level, I'm watching those liver enzymes because what happens with the HELP syndrome is the H stands for hemolysis. So what does that mean? They're bursting, aren't they? So what's my patient going to do? If they're bursting, what can my patient do? Bleed, 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 bleed. Um, so we've got a chance for them to hemorrhage. Then our elevated liver enzymes is the E and the L, elevated liver enzymes. So what's that telling me? What's the liver do? Metabolize medications. Are we able to metabolize any of that medication that we're giving them? So is the medication being effective? No. So they're going to be at risk for still not being able to get that blood pressure down. Huh? They're going to get toxicity because we gave them so much of that mag. And are they able to break it down and use it like it needs to? So they're, now they're going to increase their mag level. <coughs> when they increase their mag level, they're being put at risk for losing their <coughs> reflexes and going to respiratory paralysis and cardiac, cardiac arrest. Oh my gosh. Is this something to play with? Absolutely not. No. And then the other thing that's going to start happening is my platelets are going to be low. So what's that going to tell me? Huh? Can they clot? Can they stop bleeding? Can I stop this bleeding? Can I call? Can I stop this issue? No. And a lot of times my patients die. When I, my daughter had this two years ago. And so how did they treat her? It was it was pretty scary. intense. It was pretty yeah. scary. Yeah. I remember that doctor sitting in that room. Looking at my son in law saying, Son, we're going to do everything we can to save her and save the baby. It's awful. It is awful. It's a very serious, serious. And she's alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. Maybe. 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 Made it to the hospital at 4 o'clock in the morning. Took the baby by C-section at 9 because she got one shot of steroid, but because they couldn't get her blood pressure under control. And her platelet count just kept dropping and dropping. And they're like, we've got to do something now, otherwise she's going to bleed out. So this is not something to play with. That's why you as a nurse in labor and delivery, you got to keep up with this stuff. you got to be on it. you got to be looking at those liver function tests. you got to be looking at that platelet count. You gotta be looking at that H and H. You gotta be looking at that mama. Because a lot of times when they bleed out, they're gonna bleed from every orifice of their body. So a nosebleed, don't say, oh, that happens with pregnancy. Uh -uh. Not in this situation. We're talking nosebleeds, eye bleeds, ear bleeds, bleeding everywhere. Everywhere. And nine times, I'd say, Six times out of ten is we don't save that mama. And we don't save that baby when this happens. So that's by the grace of God. And sometimes we gotta be that nurse that gets in there and sees what's going on with this mama. So we can save these babies and save these moms. So the help syndrome is not something um, that can is likely looked at because if we don't do something, mama's going to end up in renal failure. Can I help when renal failures happen? Set dialysis, um, an abruptio, and you know, as her platelet counts are being low, she's not only going. This is where the problem comes in with my baby. 
is when mama goes into this health center, yes, yeah, she's having all these things going, but what's going to happen is that placenta is going to detach from the wall, and it's going to be an abruption, and she's going to bleed inside the uterine walls, inside the uterus. Who's getting that blood? My baby. So the chances of my baby dying and my chances of my mama dying are so high with health syndrome. We never, when I worked labor and delivery, we never said this word on labor and delivery. Because we were like, mm -mm. if we say it, it might happen. So we never talked about it. We never, but I can tell you when mama's liver function test started going out of whack, and out of those playlists, you can measure by the law, we were on it. We were all in it. The patient I had was not born to a delivery, so we Sounds great. Over. All right. So, any questions about preeclampsia, eclampsia, health syndrome? It's pretty intense, right? <coughs> pretty intense stuff. All right. So, let's go to preterm labor. Labor that occurs between 20 and 36 weeks. Now, I know I said 37, but 30. If you make it to 37, one week, then you're not preterm anymore. Okay. Um, Lem percent of our births are premature. There is a table on page 407, and that is in whatever, I think I have the fifth edition, um, that gives you multiple risk factors of preterm labor. My cervical cancer didn't help anything. That's why I was a preterm labor. Um, education is vital, 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 vital. And being able to promptly diagnose that it's preterm labor is what gets you that term baby or that baby that's viable. Um, one of the things, medications that you give moms are tocolytics. Um, medications like prethine um, and tributylene are the same thing. That is generally what we give moms. That is a smooth muscle relaxant, and it helps make that uterus not contract. Um, side effects is hypotension. One of the things that I felt like when I was on breathing or tribuling is I felt like my heart was going to jump out of my chest. 
my heart rate probably ran 130 to 140 all the time. And my, I mean, it was, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, didn't have any problems with my uh, glucose, but patients sometimes do have problems with their glucose going up. And then that may put them at risk for gestational diabetes as well. Um, maternal pulmonary edema and maternal dyspareunias. Um, yeah, just talk about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you, I mean, we've talked a little bit about all this stuff, but I'm going to talk to you about what happened with me. I think I've talked to you um, a little bit about me starting at 17 weeks. And that's when I started thinning my cervix out. So that from then on, I had to go to the doctor every week. And they check my cervix, check my cervix. So at 25 weeks, I went in full fledged labor. Um, one of the things that I noticed was I just don't feel right. So, you know, they took me to the doc, they took me to the hospital. I had changed my cervix from 60%, which I was at 17 weeks to 90%. So at 25 weeks, I was 90% with maybe a fingertip dilated just a tiny bit, which I was glad. So I wasn't dilated that much. That was 25 weeks. I continued to work. 29 weeks. I'm sitting at my house. My best friend calls me, the one that lost the twins, said, hey, can I come get Ash Ashton to take her and play with Connor? I was like, sure, her nephew. I was like, sure. I'm just not feeling too good today. So I think that I'm gonna go ahead because I monitored my, I had a TOCO monitor so I could have, monitor my uterus for an hour and then I would put it on the phone and I would send it to a nurse and she would read it. She would read and tell me how many contractions I had. If I wasn't having a lot of contractions, then she wouldn't call me. Or she may call me and just say, hey, you're looking good. Well. That day, me not feeling right, I, only, I usually monitor around 11 o'clock in the morning and about 9 o'clock at night. So I monitor two times a day. I called my husband. I said, Amy's coming to get Ashton, and I think I'm going to go ahead and monitor myself. So I monitored. I had 14 contractions and only felt two. I said, oh, geez. So one of the things for preterm labor is to hydrate yourself because that uterus is a muscle and sometimes dehydration makes the uterus contract. So one of the first things that you tell somebody when they're in preterm labor is drink water. Well, those of you that know, I hate water. And this is probably why I hate water. So they said, you know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna drink some water. They said, drink some water, go pee, drink some water, monitor again in an hour. I said, okay, so I'm chugging water that I hate, fussing and crying the whole time because I hate water. You know, things for me to be worried, fussing about. I hate water. <laughs> so anyway, I'm over here drinking my water, and so I monitored again. Do you think it helped? No, water didn't help. So I monitored. I had 14 more contractions and felt two. So, of course, I called Mark, my GYN, my OB doctor, and said, no, he actually called me because the TOCO people called him and said, this is what's going on. So Mark calls me and I'm like, hey, he's like, meet me at the hospital. I've got your bed ready. <laughs> I'm not going on mag. He said, Lynn, get to the hospital. Just to let you know, I'm not going on that. <laughs> he hung up on me. <laughs> so we got in the car, and all the way there, I'm telling my husband, don't you let them get to me tonight. Don't, don't you do it. Don't you do it. He was like, okay, whatever. So I get in the room, um, and there is two egg crates on my bed. The lights are off. And there's nothing, I mean, everything's very quiet. They put me in a corner in the room so it'd be real quiet. And I'm in, I am not going on mine. <laughs> and 
they're like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. So as I get in the bed, I peek it again, I got in the bed, the physician's sitting right here, grabs my arm, and guess what he does? He gives you some mag. Steel mag. <laughs> Steel mag. Well, the thing of it is, is I was on mag for about two hours, and I was still contracting. Still contracting. He said, let me check you. It's like, okay. Three centimeters, still 90% of base at 29 weeks. So, we were starting to pray really hard and preparing ourselves that we were going to Charlotte to have a 29 week little wimpy white boy. <laughs> so as we tried everything, I was on that mag and I was still contracting. So he said, okay, I'm gonna put you on breathing tube, sub -cube. Okay, now, so now let's think about mag and the side effects of mag. Makes you very laid back, makes your reflexes diminish, makes you visual disturbances. You're really laid back. Tributylene, what does that make you do? Heart rate's 160. You know, mine was 110 or something like that. Feels like you're jumping out of your chest, shaking like crazy. So I had two side effects going at one time. Um, and so he finally came in and said, okay, you have one hour to stop. And I'm like, so what am I supposed to do? <laughs> he said, you just lay here, let the medicine, do some relaxation, and put some very calm music on, do, wouldn't let anybody in the room. And to tell you this, the truth, y'all, this was amazing because I had an older couple in my church that they would drive to see everybody when they were in the hospital. They came in. They got beside my bed on their, on their knees. My OB doctor got on his knees. Everybody that I worked with, because I worked at this hospital, was around my bed on their knees. And I stopped. I stopped contracting. I can't say that it was MAC, Tributylene. I think it was God. My, that's just my personal opinion. And I stopped. And I was able to go home and deliver my baby at 38 weeks. As I went, and when I went home, I went home on a sub-Q tributylene pump. And so, you know diabetics, the pumps that they have? That's what I had. So I had a sub-Q tributylene pump. And I stayed in the bed. Basically, just stayed in the bed. I went from the bed to the shower, the bed, uh, to the bed, to the couch. And I did that. When I started, uh, and every day I was monitoring myself, and every day I drank water, and I drank water, and I drank water, and I hate water, and that's why you'll never see me drink water again. Um, but that is what happens when moms are compliant to what we're telling them to do. Who would have thought at 29 weeks being three centimeters, 90% of base could have carried it from 29 weeks to 38 weeks. All because I said I just don't feel right. Somebody listened. So there are preterm moms that can go out and make it. We can make it if we listen to our bodies, we'll do what they're telling us to do, and we can have babies that are not born preterm. So that's my story. And if y'all seen Dylan now, he's um, very, very, um, he's full, <laughs> for one thing, because he was my miracle baby. Um, but he is the most loving person you'll ever, ever meet. He may meet you and tell you that he loves you, hugs you, it's crazy. And he attributed it because he feels like he was given that chance to live and be. I mean, yes, he drove me to drink. I'm telling you, he drove me to drink bad when he was young. Um, but I think he's a little miracle baby. So, anyways, you can see that the things that I've got on my slide as far as being able to care for a mom who's preterm labor, the biggest thing is education. 
with them, bed rest, drinking a lot of fluid, laying on their left side, emptying their bladder a lot. Remember I told you that Dr. Peacock wrote a list of stuff that I couldn't do, like don't leave the washing machine or unload the washing machine or dishwasher or anything. No lifting of heavy objects. No sexual activity. That was probably one of the hardest things for my husband. <laughs> and then um, making sure that you listen to your body and have medications that you need. All right, so do we have any questions about this unit? All right, so what we can do, we can take about a 10, let's say a 15 minute break, come back, and then you can think about any questions that you want, I can clarify anything, and then I'll talk to you about skin day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.